Hello, everyone. So is, uh, thank you for the kind introduction. My name is Vedran. Um, thank you for coming after lunch. Uh, I'm hoping not to put you necessarily to sleep. I would like to start with uh, two semi-apologetic disclaimers. First, um, I've gotten sick at the beginning of this week, and I, I missed a lot of the conference, and I've heard that it was amazing. And there was a bunch of amazing talks which I unfortunately missed. And because I'm still a little bit ill, there's a small chance that I might start coughing uncontrollably, so I apologize in advance if, if this is to happen. And also, if I start ranting or speaking too quickly or you have any questions, please interrupt me at any point. Okay. So the first part of my disclaimer was that I missed a bunch of talks. This is a bit problematic because um, in my talk, I will be referring to a bunch of talks that presumably happened at the beginning of the week because I went through the booklet and people said they were, would be talking about certain things, but I'm not sure that if they did. So if I start mentioning, and as Hans Briegel was saying, and he didn't say that, please do stop me, and then I'll uh, be more specific. So I, I think in, in this particular venue, I don't have to talk about what quantum machine learning is about. right? It's this new emergent field, uh, which combines aspects of machine learning or artificial intelligence as a more general field, and quantum information processing. And it's sort of driven by two main research lines. Uh, one asking whether we can use quantum information processing to uh, help in machine learning problems, and conversely, whether we can use machi machine learning in some quantum information processing type of uh, a setting. But it's not the only two things which exist, right? I mean, uh, I'm certain Gael was talking about something which I would call generalizations of learning-like concepts when we learn about information which is somehow inherently quantum. Then there are things like machine-inspired quantum information processing and things like uh, even physics-inspired machine learning. Now, in this talk today, I'll be talking about really this intersection between machine learning and QIP, quantum information processing, but for a specific flavor of learning, which is called reinforcement learning. Um, just can, can you give me a show of hands? Is there anybody who's actually actively using reinforcement learning in their research or work? Um, okay, so I will certainly make mistakes in my talk, and please do correct me uh, about things that I will say about reinforcement learning because I have my own personal take uh, on this mode of learning. Uh, right, so I've been working on the intersection of machine learning and the QIP in the context of reinforcement learning for a number of years now, and I'm still very excited about the particular field. And um, I will be talking about most of those two principal directions of, of the interaction, like seeing whether we can use machine learning to help in quantum information, using, uh, quantum information processing tasks, but specifically reinforcement learning, and the converse, whether we can use uh, quantum effects to help in reinforcement learning. And the talk is split into two parts. And I think in terms of time, I will mostly be actually talking about classical reinforcement learning, what it's about, because I don't think it's a very exposed uh, flavor of machine learning. And I think you should learn about it if you haven't so far. So I will tell you the basics of reinforcement learning, progress and certain canonical limitations that we have in this field. And I will tell you a little bit about how classical reinforcement learning has already been successfully applied in the context of reinforcement learning, uh, quantum information processing, referring to other people's works mostly. In the second part, you know, spinning the story around. Uh, we will address some of the shortcomings that I will mention in the first part of the talk and ask whether uh, we can use quantum information processing to help there. Um, so <clears throat> I suppose up until very recently, if you, if you stopped your, your uh, run-of-the-mill practitioner of machine learning and you asked them what they did, uh, with very high probability, they will tell you that they're doing something which has to do with supervised learning or something which has to do with unsupervised learning. So I'm sure most of you know it, but I have to run through the motion and tell you a little bit about these things, just to contrast it uh, to reinforcement learning. In supervised learning, what we're really doing is we're generalizing our knowledge, right? So we typically deal with a setting where you have a bunch of, let's say, labeled examples or, or you know, points for which we have some numbers associated to them, and we're trying to infer the labeling rule, which tells us how to label the points which we don't have in our training set. In contrast, in unsupervised learning, we're trying to infer, infer something about the structure of our data itself which can be either clustering type thing, where we're identifying properties of the underlying distribution which generate our data, or generative things, which means like we're trying to generate more data from the same distribution based uh, on a small set of examples. Now, reinforcement learning uh, at the face of it looks a little bit different. It's an interactive mode of learning, but in this talk I'll, I'll clarify that it's actually very closely related and there are huge overlaps, and reinforcement learning cannot really live without these other two notions of machine learning. So in, if you've attended the talk by Hans Briegel, I think he, he, he's the one who would be the first one to talk about agents and environments. So in reinforcement learning, we talk about an ent entity called an agent, which exists relative to a task environment, which it can perceive by receiving signals, sometimes called percepts or states of the environment. 
and which can act on the environment performing actions. And in the reinforcement learning paradigm, time and again, uh, the agent is given a rewarding signal saying that its behavior was correct. Right, so there are like two, two, two components of the story. One is how the environment changes on the actions of the agent and what we want the agent to actually, actually learn. So let me be a little bit more specific about this just to show you that there's a little bit of math behind it um, and to, to introduce some terminology. So in reinforcement learning, we have two things. We have the agent and the environment, and we have two alphabets, the alphabet of signals or the environmental states and the alphabet of actions which denote in an abstract sense what the agent can do in a given environment. Um, to an agent, at any given time point, we can associate a policy. A policy is simply a function, or more specifically, conditional probability distribution, which specifies what will the agent do if it sees the environment to be in some given state. It simply says what the agent does in a given situation. Now, what's an environment? Environment is a complex object. It's a dynamical system with memory. Uh, one very simple family of environments are so-called Markov decision processes. So Markov decision processes have environmental states, a bunch of them, so it's the state that the environment is in in any given time. And these are the things that the agent can perceive. Now, the agent's actions can cause transitions on the environmental states. They can be deterministic or probabilistic, this depends. You can think of really, like the agent performs a Markov chain-like transition on the environment by performing some, some specific action. And to make this thing a uh, you know, reinforcement learning setting, there's also a notion of a reward, which usually means that certain transitions or state action state pairs, so arcs in, in, in my graph, are the rewarding ones. So now once I've defined a policy and I define what environment is, I can start computing quantities. Like, for instance, you know, the average reward is a function of time. And I can start assigning figures of merit to things. I can say, if I fix a particular policy, I can, for instance, compute the finite horizon reward, which says, well, what's the total reward I will receive up until some time step n, starting from some time step t. It's a well-defined quantity once you define what the environment is like and once you define the policy of the agent. Or you can do things like infinite horizon learning, in which I'm interested in really an infinite reward, which is depreciated by some uh, geometric decay. This, this gamma is real number strictly smaller than one, so this thing uh, will not diverge. Once I define these figures of merit, I can also think about optimal policies. So it's a simply a mathematical object which maximizes this quantity or this quantity. And you can think of, for the purposes of this talk, even though I will not entirely subscribe to this, what the agent learns in a reinforcement learning setting is a policy which is optimal with respect some, to some figure of merit. This is sort of the goal of the thing. Um, now, just to point out that this reinforcement learning setting is sort of pervasive and exists uh, the all instances. For instance, it exists as a mathematical construct which I just described. It exists in biological agents. This is more or less how simple animals and babies learn by trial and error. You do something, you fail, this is your rewarding signal. It exists in robotics, where you can have a Roomba which perhaps learns how to navigate its environment to clean most efficiently. Or it can uh, exist in, in a virtual setting. We have virtual agents which learn how to play virtual games within a computer, right? This is a 2014 Nature paper uh, by the uh, uh, Google group. And I should mention, I, I like to advertise reinforcement learning as much as I can. I, I unfortunately will not do that too much today. It was just one of the breakthrough technologies of 2017, even though reinforcement learning is a really, really old concept. It's like the first natural mode of learning, right? Um, now, it's, for me, it's always an interesting exercise if you think about supervised learning and unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning, you know, why are these things called learning? What is the same in these things and what's different? So if you think about supervised and unsupervised learning, I, I think the thing which is the same is how you learn and what actually constitutes learning. And in both cases, you're actually solving some kind of an optimization problem. So you have some sort of a model specified by, by theta, which can be a neural network, SVM, whatever or an RBM, uh, Boltzmann machine, and you're trying to minimize the error on, on your local training set plus some term which is controlling your complexity. Uh, so this is the same in these two modes of learning. What about reinforcement learning? Well, as I mentioned, in reinforcement learning, you can think about it as a process in which over time the agent will learn some optimal policy with respect to some figure of merit. You know, what it means to be optimal can differ from setting to setting. And what's a policy? Well, a policy is something which assigns an action to a state, right? So this actually suggests that these two things might be closely, closely related. So somehow learning this correct action state association is similar to learning the correct label data association. And in fact, they are similar, and I will argue briefly that reinforcement learning strictly generalizes supervised learning. 
There are other ways of looking at the story as well, but it will not be important. What is very different between these two settings is how the data is accessed. It's, it's restricted in a reinforcement learning setting and how it's organized. Now let me spend a little bit of time explaining uh, what, this, what I mean by this, an example of learning how to play chess. And I'm purposefully not choosing Go because everybody likes Go, <laughs> but I, I will talk about chess. So it turns out that learning how to play chess or playing chess can also be described as a Markov decision process. So the state of the environment is simply the full description of the board. And at each state of the environment, the player whose turn it is, has the power to pr produce some actions, which simply means move a figure on the board. In principle, there are many, many possible actions, I don't know, 60, 80, I don't know how many, which cause a transition from state to state. And in this case, the transition is deterministic, right? You do something, you necessarily end up in the next configuration of the board, and so on. And if you look at this picture, it kind of suggests that the underlying mark of decision process is sort of a tree-like structure, right? Each move allows, is, is, uh, the number of possible moves gives me the uh, n r -A -T of my tree, so to speak. It is almost like that. It's not really fully a tree. So this is a nice picture that I found online. These are a collection of games played by Gasparov. And the green games are the games that he won, and the red games are the games that he lost. He mostly wins. So each one of these things is really a trajectory moves uh, in, in a given game. So now the MDP is tree-like, but not a, not a tree, because you, know, you can revert back to a state you had before, sometimes in chess. Uh, but the most important component of it is that down the line, if you're solving the natural reinforcement learning problem of playing chess, the only true feedback you get in the end is whether you win or lose at the end of the game. So you have to play a large sequence of moves before you get any sort of a rewarding signal. Uh, and this is a huge distinction between standard supervised learning and reinforcement learning. And also maybe I would like to point out that you can also think, or I like to think of reinforcement learning as about learning how to navigate on a graph. Where the graph is the graph of the Markov decision process here, the game tree uh, in the context of chess. So uh, just to highlight that there's a different, less natural way of describing how to play chess. And this is a, a playing chess when you have a, like a god, play, god level player expert on the side who simply immediately tells you whether your move was the optimal move to, to do or not. In this case, the rewards would be uh, immediate. And in this case, this would bring reinforcement learning much closer to supervised learning because you find out whether your label was correct at each time instance, right? Um, the further distinction between supervised learning and reinforcement learning is that in the reinforcement learning case, there's a strong causal and temporal structure. So my actions and the environment change the environmental state in a very, very specified manner, right? In the case of chess, it is deterministic. What I do uniquely specify what happens with the environment next. In supervised learning, there is no causality. In fact, you typically assume that your data points are IID distributed, so completely uncorrelated. Um, and in this sense, I would like to say that basic reinforcement learning somehow trivially generalizes supervised learning, but it also generalizes all other more interactive learning modes like uh, active learning, etc. cetera. Um, also, maybe one thing that I want to point out, um, that the same MDP can have a very different optimal policy depending on you know, fine tuning what you mean by optimality. Uh, for instance, these infinite horizon rewards or finite horizon rewards may lead to different notions of optimality and different notions of what an optimal policy is. So, uh, reinforcement learning is very general. It's it, autonomous. It can lead to AI. It's how intelligent agents learn. It's like the best thing. Um, and, and now let's think just for a second on, how, on whether we can actually do it the way I described. So let's think about uh, playing chess or playing Go and think about what, would, what it would actually mean to learn how to play chess by just doing pure reinforcement learning. Well, in the best case, that would mean that I know what to do in a situation in which I've seen before. Now, believe it or not, the number of actual boards you will see over your life is very, very large, but still you know, very, very small compared to the total number of boards you can, you can see. And in Go, it's even worse than that. So in fact, if the only thing I could possibly learn to do are the things that I've already seen before, I could never learn to play chess. I might learn how to play tic-tac-toe, but not chess. So what we actually do is something better than this. We're not just doing pure reinforcement learning. We generalize over our, our previous experiences. So we, we have our experience, we played, we had situations, and then we somehow start associating new situations which are not identical to previous ones, but they're somehow similar, and we start doing similar things. And this is a notion of generalization which appears in, in reinforcement learning, which is critical so Go and chess have finite state spaces, but they're astronomical. So it makes no sense to try to learn it really by, by, by experience. The thing is, humans and, and biological agents do more than just generalization of personal experiences. We actually generate fictitious experiences. And, and in chess, this is every single situation when you start you know, playing a local move, 
and you're trying to understand what's the best thing to do, and then you imagine what your counterpart would play. So if I move, make this move, then my counterpart plays this move, ah, this was a mistake, I will not go that way. So in fact, generation of fictitious experience is critical uh, to real life solution of reinforcement learning problems. And this is what I call the cake picture, or, or the cake slide. Uh, has anybody seen the cake picture before? Okay, a few people have. Um, so this is a, a picture that is told from Jan LeCun, who was explaining what his perspective on, on intelligence is. He's using the term intelligence. I will use the term reinforcement learning in a general sense, because at this level, they're really mutually interchangeable. So what he's saying, intelligence or really general learning is a cake. And the, 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 the most experiences that we actually have in our real life are, are not real. They're things that we imagine in our heads. They're fictitious experiences. Why? Because the experiences that we actually have, the direct experiences, which is pure reinforcement learning, they're really expensive. We can do it only so many times, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, not, not very many times. We can, however, generalize over our direct experience, but on a large, large scale of things, we generalize over a re rel relatively small data set. Right? In your life, by the age of you're 30, you've seen something like 10 billion images. That's it. 10 billion images of everything in your life. And you're generalizing over sub subsections of this. So one could argue that most of the things we actually do is really fictitious. We're generalizing things, uh, generating things in the mind. Um, so the arguments these days that we somehow know how to generalize, we know how to do supervised learning things, we know how to do reinforcement learning, but the question of generation and fictitious experience is a little bit iffy. We don't really know how to solve this, and this might be one of the reasons why we don't really have proper intelligent behavior. Or so it is said. I'm not the expert, I'm just citing here. Um, but there has been progress in reinforcement learning, and I will address the progress with respect to this generalization part, to the icing of the cake, and to the generation, generation part. So as you can imagine, in generalization, uh, the idea is to go from a situation where I only know what to do in a given situation that I've seen before, uh, to function approximation of a larger set of possibilities. So instead of just specifying a tabular thing which tells me what to do in a given situation, I will identify a family, which in modern times is most often a neural network, which specifies what will come as an action given a state I haven't seen before based on somehow closely related things, where the, closely, the relation closely related is something you learn over your uh, experience. And it's not a new idea. So linear models for generalization were done in the f almost the first works on reinforcement learning by Sutton. Neural networks were introduced in the 92. Decision trees would use, et cetera. What happened in recent times is through the success of deep learning, this has you know, poured over into the reinforcement learning picture. And one of the results was this very famous uh, result of AlphaGo. Time will actually tell whether this is really a transformative thing or not. The thing is also in the gener generation problem, so recall in, in standard machine learning, generation is about generative models, uh, probabilistic models, et cetera. In reinforcement learning, one close thing to this is really model-based learning, in which the agent builds up a picture, his proxy of the real environment it's living in, with which it can interact internally, generating fictitious experiences. And, and so this is sort of, you have a robot, which is imagining itself relative to a model, and it's spinning things in the head instead of doing costly real-life interaction. And this model doesn't have to be very, very complicated to make it useful. For instance, again in AlphaGo, the model was, in specifically in the AlphaGo Zero implementation, the model was just a copy of the software itself, so the software played itself. This is really an instance of model-based learning, which generates a bunch of fictitious experiences. It was very, very successful. Um, now I need to check for a second just how I'm on the time. And I'm horrible, wonderful. Okay, uh, so I would just like to point out that even though this reinforcement learning story has these three layers of problems, one which is the cherry, the icing, which is the generalization, and the body of the cake, which is the generation, already the cherry is extremely useful. And in fact, it has been successfully applied in many contexts in quantum information processing. And we'll just quickly run through uh, what some people have considered. So for instance, uh, Marin Bukov has looked at using reinforcement learning in the context of control problems when he's, when he's trying to implement a particular unitary by controlling pulses as a function of time. Uh, on a slightly higher uh, level of abstraction of using quantum computers, uh, uh, Paulson, Artrup, Hendrik, uh, co collaborator of ours from Innsbruck, is looking into using reinforcement learning to optimize error correcting codes in a sort of live process of running a quantum computation. 
Um, then on an even higher level of abstraction, people have looked at using reinforcement learning for optimizing decoders for recruiting codes and also for generating uh, like online memory decouplers which preserve uh, memory from decoherence. And on the highest level of abstraction, you've heard the talk, I hope you've heard the talk because I wasn't here, but I'll say on how you can use reinforcement learning to even teach a machine to generate new quantum experiments. So it's been applied already and I, I think it's going to become even more important as time goes on. Uh, I would just like to point out that all of these examples that I've very briefly listed also have a bare supervised learning or even an optimization formulation. So each one of the problems that were solved you can write down as an optimization problem. And as I mentioned, you know, reinforcement learning generalizes supervised learning. And if there's no structure to the problem, if there's no control feature, if there's no temporal correlation, then in fact it's suboptimal to use reinforcement learning. However, if there is structure, and there is feedback in the system you're actually using in real time, if the system is adaptive and is online, then it really makes sense to use reinforcement learning. So, you know, each problem has the optimal tool and not, there's no one, one fix for all. I think Nana mentioned no free lunch theorems. It's sort of a fundamental no free lunch theorem. Okay, and this brings me to the second part of the talk, where I want to somehow give you some of our ideas on how quantum uh, FX could help with one, two of these sort of fundamental problems with reinforce, reinforcement learning, the, the generation problem and the generalization problem. Uh, so I'll start with this part. So there's the pure reinforcement learning, which was the cherry, the generalization problem, which is you know generalizing over our personal experiences we had, and the generation problem, which is creating fictitious experiences which we didn't have. <clears throat> so let's start with the first part. And here I will be heavily connecting to uh, projective simulation, which is a model for designing learning agents, also reinforcement learning agents, which Hans talked about on Monday, I think. And uh, specifically the quantum reflect reflective uh, projective simulation model, which I hope was talked about by Christoph Wunderlich. I don't know if that happened. Um, I will tell you very, very briefly about that now. So uh, there are many ways to implement generalization in uh, reinforcement learning. As I said, the most successful approaches these days are deep neural networks. But already in 2004, people have actually considered using generative models to generate generalization. Um, how? This picture here depicts uh, a standard restricted Boltzmann machine. I'm sorry, I will not have much time to go into details what these things are, but this is sort of a mathematical specification of a family of distributions using relatively few parameters. Each one of these nodes you can think of as a binary variable. So I have three red binary vari variables decoding eight possible values, and here I have two decoding two possible values, and this thing here specifies some probability distribution over these variables here. And I can simply think of the first three bits as being bits encoding an action, or a percept, or a state, and the blue bits is bits encoding uh, an action. So I have a, an exponential compression, right? To each I have combinatorially many states in the number of variables. And once I have such a probability distribution, well, the conditional probability distribution is a valid function. And it was mentioned today that in fact, already RBMs are universal approximators in that if you allow me exponentially many hidden units, I'm approximating any conditional, any probability distribution, then especially any conditional probability distribution. So this is one way uh, to use RBMs to do generalization in, in reinforcement learning by encoding uh, the policy, right? The action given state function. How to train it is beside the point for me right now. And uh, I should point out that in recent times, like a few years ago, our colleagues from the one qubit group have looked into this way of, of doing reinforcement learning from a quantum perspective. Why? Well, as you know, quantum computers, specifically annealers, have been quite extensively investigated by Alejandro and, and people like him to, to train and, and, and use generative models, specifically RBMs and deep, uh, deep uh, Boltzmann machines. Uh, so one idea was, well, maybe we can do this in a deep structure using quantum annealers to get better behavior in, in, in reinforcement learning. And in fact, they give evidence that this might, might work. So the idea here would be to simply train and, and execute these conditional probability distributions faster on a quantum computer. Now, uh, we have come to similar conclusions from a completely different perspective. So we were studying this model of uh, projective simulation, which again is a framework for defining learning agents, which is based on a bunch of very fundamental principles, a uh, bunch of simple principles, the one being that 
any information processing done by the agent is done on a specific type of a memory system, which is called an episodic and compositional memory, which simply arranges the experiences of the agent in a stochastic network. So it's an object that, the, that can you know, execute a random walk. I don't need to tell you much more at the moment about what the PS is about, but this network is supposed to be used for the agent to project itself into conceivable situations. This is a citation from the very first paper. Um, five minutes? I will give you exactly one half of the talk then. Um, uh, so, so somehow in the PS it was embedded that it should be generating fictitious experiences. Um, now there are a couple of flavors of projective simulation, one of which uh, the execution of the action of the agent is done by a random walk, which is terminated the first time the agent encounters a memorized action, which is a hitting type of projective simulation, which I believe Hans talked about and Alexei used in the quantum experiments paper. However, there's another model which is a mixing type uh, PS in which the end of the random walk process is achieved when an equilibrium distribution over the, the memory is, uh, is achieved. So, it's a, so the deliberation is specified by some Markov chain over sort of the memory of the agent. Specifically, there is this Markov chain specified by the memory of the agent, and the output distribution is a conditional distribution specified by the steady state of the Markov chain. It's a very technical thing. For, for the moment being, just let's agree that there's a random walk here which specifies some distribution whose, condition, whose conditioning specifies the action probability of the agent. It's a very, very general framework, but it turns out it trivially contains any kind of a probabilistic model as a way of achieving generalization. In particular, I had this picture here with an RBM which uh, specified you know, conditional probability distribution over the states given actions. Well, this thing here is some uh, uh, asymptotic distribution, some limiting distribution of a Gibbs sampler. Right? If I were to try to at uh, attain this Gibbs distribution over these, these uh, nodes, one thing I might do is simply run Gibbs sampling. But Gibbs sampling is nothing but a Markov chain process, which in fact can be run on the ECM of the agent. So it's, it's a special case. Now the difference between our approach and the approach uh, that was done by the one qubit group which was looking into annealers to generate these things is that we started from a completely different point of view. We simply wanted to connect quantum walks uh, with deliberations of agents, specifically seg segregated type quantum walks, which can be used uh, to attain limiting distributions more efficiently. And in one of our early works, we actually showed uh, how to use quantum, quantum walks to achieve conditional probability distributions more efficiently with a quadratic speed up over, over uh, classical uh, processes in terms of number of interaction steps. Uh, I think Christoph Gundelich was talking about this uh, because we have now first pr proof of principle experimental uh, demonstrations of this thing. Now, I just want to highlight one technical thing. And the technical thing is that uh, you, could, you could simply, you, you could think that the only problem we're really solving here is finding these Gibbs distributions of a specific uh, Boltz machine. This is not entirely true because in full reinforcement learning context, uh, the distributions that the agent is supposed to output at every time step are, are correlated because the agent learns as a function of time. So each time step here is an update of the memory of the agent which occurs as the agent learns. As it learns, it changes its underlying probability distribution, but in a controlled way. It's not you know, diverging very, very rapidly, which means that these distributions are close. We can actually use this to speed up our mixing times. So we're not starting from a situation we have a, f a given you know, input, which is an RBM, and we're trying to find its steady state. We actually have already samples from a distribution which is promised to be close. Uh, and using this, we did a couple of works showing how you can do not quadratic, but uh, fourth degree speed ups over best classical possible algorithms. And we've recently uh, uh, given some arguments that this should, should be optimal, that you cannot do better. Interestingly, connecting to things to do with quantum money, uh, comput uh, computational no cloning theorems was quite interesting. So now I'm at a couple, couple more minutes. Okay, I, I should just point out that in projective simulation, the non-quantum part, we've all re also investigated uh, restricted types of generalization and generation really in the classical case, but this is maybe not important. So the last part of the talk has to do with quantum enhancements for planning, which are these generative aspects of re reinforcement learning. And, and uh, we've actually done this implicitly. So at the very beginning, maybe two, three years ago, we started investigating what reinforcement learning looks like in a fully quantum context. And I believe Jacob Taylor was talking about this, where we said, okay, if I allow some sort of a quantum interaction between an environment and an agent, I can somehow relate reinforcement learning to oracle identification type problems, and I can actually achieve quantum speedups in genuine learning. Now, 
a model of the agent, uh, so the, the, the real classical environment, of course, is not a quantum object. I cannot quantum access my environment. I cannot walk in superposition because I'm a large, heavy, overweight body, right? But a model is a fictitious thing. It's happening in the, in the mind of the agent. And here, anything that I can do on paper, I can actually realize, provided I have a large enough quantum computer. In other words, the limits of improvements in terms of access to models are lower bounded by limits of improvements of quantum generalized environments. So as I said, we looked into scenarios where we have quantum access to an environment, and we've shown separation between classical and quantum agents. And now we're simply saying that whenever I'm doing model-based learning, I actually can enforce that I have an effective quantum environment. So all the resu results we have here sets lower bounds on what can be done in the quantum case for, for learning agents. Um, so we've done a bunch of things here, showing how to improve meta-learning, how to use Grover-like uh, amplitude amplification to speed up learning in, in a quite general class of lock favoring environments. And very recently, we've done a, a work showing that even strictly exponential separations are possible by effectively encoding a well-understood and known classical oracular problem where there exists a quantum separation, which is exponential, called Simon's problem. We've simply embedded it in a reinforcement learning problem, specifically into a Markov decision process. And then almost for free, you have to do, work out a few technicalities. You get that no classical agent can learn in this environment in less than exponential amount of time, whereas quantum agents can learn very, very rapidly. Um, OK, so let me just finish with uh, a few take home messages. So I want to tell you that reinforcement learning is a very general learning model, which has natural applications whenever your environment is genuinely interactive and adaptive. It has natural applications in some quantum information processing tasks, specifically those which are online. When you have an actual experiment running, this is the natural thing to do. Uh, it has natural bottlenecks at three levels, at the cherry level, at the glazing level, and uh, what is this called, dough level. And uh, I mentioned that it might be the case that quantum information processing can help at the level of generalization, provided, that, for instance, you want to do generalization by this uh, Boltz machine encoding. It could help at the level of generation, provided doing model-based learning and your model is actually internally quantum. Um, and we still actually don't have any results whether you can help with the cherry itself, with the pure reinforcement learning setting. And this, with this I would finish. I would like to just uh, thank uh, all the collaborators here have contributed to some parts of the work that I mentioned. So thank you. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Within the context of a reinforcement in quantum, can an oracle forget? Can uh, the reinforcement be such that the oracle prunes its knowledge so that it can forget as well as learn? So the results that we have, uh, in, in some sense, in technical terms, purify the environment. They work with a unitary extension of the environment, and we allow a little bit of interaction with the part which is not naturally accessible to the agent. What I'm saying is the results that we have show that in environments which allow the purification to be accessible to some extent by the agent, then we can turn an effective environment into an effective oracle, which is not to say that there aren't other ways of doing it. I just don't know how to do it without forcing reversibilization and, and deletion of memory. Because in classic machine learning, one of the problems is sometimes that you can't easily prune information from a net. And if your oracle in some way, by <coughs> virtue of the, the way that this works, this mechanism actually works, can forget, it may actually lead to a better result in terms of the reinforcement model. So I have to admit, I, I don't fully understand what you mean, but I would be very happy if you could explain to me after the talk. So I cannot answer more. Was, was, did you have one, Alejandro? I thought, okay. Oh, we got one. Hi. Uh, yours was a pretty interesting talk, in it? Okay. And I just uh, got lost in, uh, can you go to slide 36? I will go backwards and you can <laughs> stop. Ah, oh, 36, yeah. I actually have numbers. Sometimes. Yeah. Ah. yeah. Uh, here. There, there we go, yeah. I, I, did, I didn't get exactly what uh, uh, you meant here. I, I, I think that maybe you are running out of time. But I mean, when you talk about the model, I mean, you mean like sort of function approximation in order to, you know, 
find a relationship to predict the action value <coughs> uh, function? Or? So because I, I when, when I, I mean when I say model based yeah. learning here, I really mean about learning model uh, learning agents which explicitly construct an internal representation of the environment based on its experience. So there are things which require less. If you think about actor critic models, then I mean the value function itself tells you something about the environment, not all of it, right? Here I here I demand more. I demand that I'm really building a representation of the actual environment in the sense of input output behavior. An example of this, for instance, would be me writing down a map to the best of my knowledge as I'm walking around. But a better, better example is AlphaGo, a specific AlphaGo Zero, where the agent internally plays with itself. Right? So my model of the environment is really the agent itself. Mm -hmm. So it has full functionality. Okay, okay. Does this you. answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay. Okay, so we probably should move on. That one. <coughs> Please thank the speaker again. That was a great talk. Thank you.